Revelation chapter 12 this morning. Revelation chapter 12, as we continue our study here through this simple and easy to understand book. I would call our mind again to remembrance of understanding. You know, the book of Revelation was not written and intended to be a complexity of things that are hard to understand. We just have to understand it in the context of which it was written to the people to whom it was written. And in fact, again, I remind you, this book was written to be an encouragement to the early church, that as the events of the Roman and Jewish war, as the events of 70 AD began to unfold, that these people would be encouraged as they look around them and watched seemingly everything that they had known and understand and believed in as far as the structure of the temple and Jerusalem, the city began to fall apart. And as these armies amassed around them on the outside, that they would not become overwhelmed with fear or anxiety, but would put their hope and trust in Christ put their hope and trust in God's provision and protection over them. And so John, over and over again through this letter, relays these things back to them. Again, in sometimes seemingly complex ways to us, now some 2,000 years removed, but in language that would have been very much more understandable to a first-century Christian. A first-century Christian, specifically here in Jerusalem, who had grown up their entire life hearing the Old Testament preached to them on a regular basis, hearing this type of language, hearing this type of, of illustration being given and symbolism being given. So this morning here in Revelation chapter 12, we're going to begin our way through this chapter. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if we'll make it uh, through the entirety of it because there are some, some interesting things to unpack here. But I want to preach this morning on the woman and the dragon. The woman and the dragon, Revelation chapter 12. If you found your way there, I invite you to stand with me for the reading of God's Word. This is the Word of the Lord. A great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. And she was with child, and she cried out, being in labor and in pain to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns, and on his head were seven diadems. And his tail swept away a third of the stars of heaven and threw them down to earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she gave birth, he might devour her child. And she gave birth to a son, a male child, who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and to his throne. Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared by God, so that there she would be nourished for 1,260 days. And there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon. The dragon and his angels waged war, and they were not strong enough, and there was no longer a place found for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who is called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down, he who accuses them before our God day and night. And they overcame him because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the word of their testimony, and they did not love their life even when faced with death. For this reason rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the earth and sea, because the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, knowing that he only has a short time." And when the dragon saw that he was thrown down to earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. But the two wings of the great eagle were given to the woman so that she could fly into the wilderness to her place, where she was nourished for a time and times and half a time from the presence of the serpent. And the serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman so that he might cause her to be swept away with the flood. But the earth helped the woman. And the earth opened its mouth and drank up the river which the dragon poured out of its mouth. So the dragon was enraged with the woman and went off to make war with the rest of her children who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. 
And you can be seated this morning. Last week, as we finished chapter 11, we discussed the final trumpet and the third woe and the greatest of the woes. And in doing so, we were looking at that cataclysmic moment where the city of Jerusalem and its inhabitants saw the attack and devastation of their city and the ultimate destruction of the earthly temple. And as the book of Revelation is written, it's really kind of that's the end of the first division there. And as we begin here in chapter 12, what we're going to find is really a repetition of events that we have already seen described in the first 11 chapters, but now from a different perspective. In chapters 1 through 11, we see the victory of Christ over His enemies. That's the perspective by which we're looking at. There's this high exaltation of Christ there in victory. And in chapters 12 through 22, we're going to see some of those same events unfold, but now we're going to see it as a perspective of the victory of the church over those enemies. And I wanted to begin this morning by quoting one commentator, Milton Terry, because he lays these things out so well. Listen to what he says. He says, quote, The first part has revealed the Lamb of God under various symbols, glorious in power, opening the book of divine mysteries, avenging the martyred saints, and exhibiting the fearful judgments destined to come upon the enemies of God. Everything is viewed as from the throne of the King of heaven, who sends forth his armies and destroys the defiant murderers of his prophets and burns up their city. The second part reveals the church in conflict with infernal and worldly principalities and powers, surviving all persecution and triumphing by the word of her testimony. And after Babylon the harlot falls and passes from view, appearing as the wife of the Lamb, the tabernacle of God with men, glorious in her beauty and imperishable as the throne of God." End quote. So here we have this beautiful perspective of what we have already seen and what we are about to see from these two different perspectives. And again, all of this is this encouragement to the church, right? First, to see Christ in His beauty and His holiness, and second, to see the church in its splendor and power based upon what Christ has accomplished for them. Brothers and sisters, let us remind ourselves of this perspective that when we face difficulty in this life, the first and ultimate thing that we need to do is to look to Christ in His glory and in His power and see what He has done. There are not many things, nay, I would say there is nothing in this life that if viewed through the perspective of Christ in His power does not cease to be as bad as we think it to be in the beginning. Because when we understand who Christ is and what He has done, everything in this life fails in comparison. It's an interesting passage of Scripture, no doubt. We see several characters laid out for us here. We see a woman, we see a dragon, and we see a child. Here in verses 1 through 6, these three characters are presented to us, and they are described of who they are. And so we want to spend some time this morning understanding these characters because these are given to us because they are key players in, in all the events that are unfolding. Now, again, remember, we are, are, are starting back again with, with a rep repetition of events we've already seen. And what John is encouraging us to understand here is that everything we have seen being played out so far is is, is, is bound upon or is founded upon the three key players that we see here in this passage of Scripture. Notice there in verse 1, it says, A great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, and the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars, and she was with child, and she cried out, being in labor and in pain to give birth. John describes this here as a great sign. Now, some interpreters point to this as the, this is a, a separate thing as they describe the, the book of Revelation in, in literal or non-literal terms. But John here is not pointing this out as it's greater than any other part here, but pointing that it's an important symbol that needs to be understood. 
that, that we need to understand, the reader needs to understand who this woman is in order to understand the rest of the dynamics of the story. If you miss this part and you miss who this woman is, then everything else is not going to make sense. So we have to ask our question, who is this woman? Well, we can go back through Scripture and look at descriptions given in similar ways. But if we continue reading on in this passage, we find here that the term here used for woman is used throughout the Bible as a descriptor of the church, of the faithful people of God. Now, sometimes it's used in a negative connotation because we know throughout the Old Testament that the people of God would veer from their obedience to God and have to be corrected and brought back to Him. But we understand that this term of this woman here is used as a representative for the faithful Old Testament Israel. Those who had believed and remained faithful to God, and even considering and including those who are in Jerusalem now, in this period of time. The faithful Jews who had trusted in Christ as the Messiah, who had heard the call of the gospel and responded accordingly. Notice here the descriptor of this woman in being clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and this head with a crown of 12 stars. Similar language is used to describe Jesus. We'd look earlier and see that he was clothed with the clouds with the brightness of the sun. So this language is pointing to the glory of dominion of this woman. Right? Not in, in, in reference to the church of, of how great the individual people were, but what the glory and dominion that God has given to the church. We understand that the church has great power, that as the people of God, that we have an authority that God has given to us, not because of who we are, but because of who He is, because of what He has called and commanded us to do. He has not left us isolated. He has not left us without strength. He has not left us without power. He has not called us to do something that we are incapable of doing. He's called us to do something that He empowers us to do. And so in seeing this representative of the faithful Israel. She's clothed with this beauty and this glory and this splendor. But the key thing we need to understand in this passage here is there in verse 2 that she is with child. And she cries out being in labor because she is ready to deliver this child. This woman is ready to give birth, but not without great difficulty. The picture of this woman here as the church and as this part of what John is pointing to, we can go all the way back to the book of Genesis. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, a very familiar passage to us, but what they call the Proto-Evangelum. It's the first declaration of the gospel that we find in the Scriptures. The first promise of, of the one who would come, the Christ, the Messiah. It's a beautiful passage of Scripture. It says, I will put enmity between you and woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. What God is pointing to in the garden here in the midst of Adam and Eve's disobedience. There's, there's so many beautiful gospel pictures there in the garden and we don't have time to look at all of them this morning. But even just in as Adam and Eve sinned. And they, sin came in and they discovered their, they understood their nakedness before God. They attempted to cover up their sin for themselves. They attempted to make fig leaves and cover up their own sinfulness, but it was not good enough. So what did God do? God killed an animal and clothed them with that animal's skin. There's such a beautiful picture there, right? We try to cover our own sin. We try to cover up ourselves, but it's only through the shed blood of Jesus, the final atoning sacrifice, that we can find the covering that we need for our sin. And so here in this moment, God promises that through the seed of the woman, and that's an important thing to understand here. We're going we're gonna to break this out in a little bit later on, but it needs to be mentioned here, that through the seed of the woman, through the lineage, through the family, through the descendants of this woman, is coming the Messiah. And ultimately, Satan is going to do everything he can to undo what God is trying to do. And that's why he said, you shall bruise him on the heel, but Jesus is going to bruise him on the head. Jesus is going to ultimately crush Satan under his feet. So we understand full well that this passage here in Genesis finds its fulfillment in the birth of Jesus. Jesus. 
So here what we find is a descriptor of the Old Testament church in Israel, of the faithful Israel, as a woman who is in labor. So, so why is, is this illustration? Why is it this? Well, because we understand that throughout the Old Testament, faithful Israel is the one who is carrying out what God has commanded them to do. Through everything that they go through, through every trial and tribulation, they are ensuring that God's promise is going to happen. So we can see this from the very beginning in Genesis to this moment when Jesus is actually born. That entire time, the nation of Israel, as this illustration describes, is in labor with the Christ child. And they are ensuring and keeping forth by their faithfulness and by their obedience, God uses them to ensure that Jesus is born exactly as the Scriptures promised that he would be. John pulls his description here of this woman from Isaiah chapter 26, verses 17 through 21. Let me read it for you this morning. As the pregnant woman approaches the time to give birth, she writhes and cries out in her labor pains. Thus were we before you, O Lord. We were not pregnant. We writhed, we were pregnant. We writhed in labor. We gave birth as it seems only to wind. We could not accomplish deliverance for the earth, nor were the inhabitants of the world born. Your dead will live. Their corpses will rise. You who lie in the dust awake and shout for joy, for your dew is as the dew of the dawn, and the earth will give birth to departed spirits. Come, my people, enter into your rooms and close your doors behind you. Hide for a little while until indignation runs its course. For behold, the Lord is about to come out to his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity, and the earth will reveal her bloodshed and no longer cover her slain. So here, in this moment, we find this fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy as well. Any mother will tell you that the arrival of a child is not without great tribulation and pain and trial. And throughout the Old Testament, Israel had suffered in many different ways as they continued to labor in pain for the arrival of the Messiah. In the aftermath of the flood, of the captivity in Egypt, to the exodus, to the captivity under numerous pagan nations, they labored forth to bring forth the Christ. I'm always intrigued by how in the Lord's providence, oftentimes what we discuss in Sunday school uh, seemingly ties in with our sermon for Sunday. And we were in Psalm chapter 18 this morning where David is celebrating God and praising Him for His deliverance. And there's just such this beautiful thing we see in understanding of God's protection over His people. Because you think about it, it, it doesn't seem natural. Because remember how many times God would command the nation of Israel to go in in obedience, to go into a land and annihilate the entirety of that land, to wipe it off the face of the earth. And it would seemingly be in response that when Israel would be attacked by some of these other nations, that they would have done the same thing to them. Why would they carry them off into captivity and not just annihilate this nation from the face of the earth that had been doing this to other nations? Why? Because we understand that God's provision and protection lay, lay over them. Why? Because the promised one, the Messiah, had to come through the lineage of the nation of Israel. God had promised that this woman's lineage, his seed, would be protected. And so throughout the Old Testament, we see that provision over and over and over again even as they face difficulty and trial and tribulation to bring forth the promised one. Secondly, I want you to notice here that the second character. It says that there's a, another sign which appears in the heavens. And behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns. And on his head were seven diadems. And his tail swept away a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth so that when she gave birth, he might devour her child. Notice here, John describes this as another sign. But he doesn't decide the sign is great, but he describes the one who appears in the sign as great. A great red dragon. Now, time does not allow us this morning to 
to really go back and look at all the Old Testament passages that refer to creatures like this in reference to evil forces and dominions. But it's the reason that John uses the language here, because he is describing something. He wants us to understand, the reader to understand, the, the, the tremendous awe and fear that Satan emulates here in these moments. His anger and his fury against God, his anger and his fury against Christ, and in relation to that, to against the church that's about to be poured out upon the earth. He describes this dragon as having seven heads and ten horns. And these are all the characteristics of the beast in the visions of Daniel, which we studied a few months ago. If we were to go back and see those beasts in the book of Daniel, and you need to add up the number of heads and horns that they have, it's surmised here. John is pointing to the fact that all of the empires of these pagan nations, all of these ones who have risen up over time against the nation of Israel and specifically against the church and God, have all had one element in common. They were all being controlled by Satan himself. You see, Satan really has nothing new to offer in his attack against the church. He merely just dresses it up in a different way. When we look at false teaching and we look at the persecution of the church, we find that it might be, again, just the words changed here or there, a couple little things on the, on the, on the, on the cover of it changed, but at the heart of it, it's, it's the same old program. Because Satan in his anger and fury against God, it, he's just not very creative when it comes to these things. We see him in repetition over and over in his attacks. One commentator pointed out, quote, that all these empires were stages in the dragon's attempt to establish his illicit empire over the world. He was the great beast of which they had only been partial images, end quote. So as we look back and we see these beasts in Daniel, and as, and as great and as powerful and as terrifying as any of them may have been, they were only a partial image of who Satan was and his attempts to destroy the Christ, the Messiah. And let me be clear this morning, we, we should never take Satan's power for granted. We know that Satan has great power to do very destructive things, but we do not have to fear his power because we have one who has already defeated him. We have one who is far more powerful than he is. But we must never be naive in understanding Satan's power to accomplish things and do things, even in our own time and generation. It does not take a lot to look around us in the world and understand Satan's power and sway over those who have not yet trusted in Christ. Notice here that in this sign... Excuse me. That in this sign, there's another descriptor of the dragon and what he does. This says that his tail swept away a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. What is being described for us here is in Satan's rebellion against God. At his ultimate doom of being cast down, Satan takes with him a third of those angels of heaven. These are the stars are in the heaven. Then, and this shows, again, his power because the tail just sweeping behind him, he carries and takes along with him a third of those who are in heaven. And one commentator pointed out that there's an interesting note. Why, why a third of the angels of heaven? Well, because in a symbolic way, we're going to find unfolding here that in his removal from heaven, Satan loses his power as the accuser before God in the throne room of heaven. Now, we understand that in an accusation, it takes two witnesses to be verified in the Old Testament and in God's, and in God's law. So if you think about it from this perspective, and I'm not trying to get too deep into math here this morning so our, our, our brains don't explode, but if you've taken away one-third, you still have two-thirds left. That means that for every accusation that Satan brings or for everything that he would do against those, there are still two witnesses to every one of his. There's a symbolic thing there. Satan's desire in everything was to pour out the full force of his fury 
against destroying Christ. Notice there, Satan is cast out of heaven, and immediately he stood before the woman who's about to give birth. Notice there at the end of verse 4, so that when she gave birth, he might devour her child. Now, why is this? Well, because Satan understands what's going to happen if this child is born. Satan understands what's going to come and to take place. Because just as clear as this message was in Genesis 3.15 to Adam and Eve, just as clear as it was, Satan understood and knew because he understands what's going to happen. So he's going to do everything he can to come against Christ. But you know what? If we go back and we study the Old Testament, we find that Satan did not just wait until Jesus was about to be born, until he attempted to bring all this to an end. This was the purpose in Satan leading Cain to kill Abel, right? Because then what did God have to do? God had to send Seth along in order for this to happen. So Satan thought he won there, right? But no, God sent Seth. We see it in the corruption of the world leading up to Noah, right? Satan had brought sinfulness into the world or sinfulness had been brought in the world. Satan continued to exacerbate it higher and higher to the point where God looks on the earth and he is sorrowful that he has created man. So he strives to destroy the whole earth. Satan stands up in victory, says, I've finally done it. But what happens? God finds one family, one remnant, one particular family, what? To keep the lineage of Christ to keep it going, to keep it moving forward in order that this promise may be fulfilled. And all throughout the Old Testament, we see place after place, time after time, where Satan attempts in his hatred of God to eliminate the nation of Israel, to eliminate that family line of Jesus in order that he can never be born. Finally culminating, we see, there when Jesus is born and Satan uses King Herod to kill those male children in the nation or in the land in order again to try to wipe out the one who is the one who was promised to come. He again fails in his attempts. But does Satan give up? No. What does he do now? Well, first we see him attempting to tempt Christ, right? Out in the wilderness, fall down and worship me and all these things will be given unto you. Satan brings great opposition to Jesus in his ministry. One thing I don't think that I never really had captured before in my studies and thinking about this was how much we see in the New Testament this pronounced ramp up of demonic activity in people throughout the New Testament, right? We, we see the influence of Satan in the Old Testament, but we don't really see these very vivid descriptions of demonic activity until we arrive to the ministry of Jesus. Well, what's going on here? Again, Satan, in his attempt to thwart the plan of God, is now here attempting to do everything he can to stop this from happening. So Satan brings great opposition to Jesus on every front in his ministry, not just through those who are possessed by demons, but through his own people, through the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the religious authorities. He corrupts them and brings them against Jesus. We know that ultimately Jesus, or excuse me, Satan turned one of Jesus' own against him, Judas, in betraying him and turning him over to the religious authorities. And finally, in a moment where Satan thinks he has succeeded, Jesus is crucified. In this moment of, of ultimate irony, right? Because this plan has been laid from the foundation of the world. This moment has been anticipated in the heavenly since before the world ever existed. God knew and had foreordained every moment, every circumstance, every event to lead us here to this moment. But yet Satan thinks he's the one who's causing all this to happen. He's the one who is using his influence against Jesus to bring all these things to pass. And I love how it says it in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. But we speak wisdom in a mystery the hidden wisdom which God predestined before the ages to our glory, the wisdom which none of the rulers of this age has understood, for if they had understood it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Jesus is crucified, but then three days later, Satan's plan is crushed again. 
And so now in this moment, Satan realizes that not only has he been unsuccessful in keeping the Christ child and keeping the promised child from being born, now he has ultimately failed in, in, in keeping Jesus from fulfilling the promise of what God has said he was going to do. So now he can't do anything against Jesus anymore. He can't try to stop this plan. So Satan turns his attention to the next best thing, the church. Because if his mind, if he can stamp out this infant church, this body of believers, this group of Christians, then he can stop this movement cold in its tracks. Now look at verse 5 with me this morning. The third character in our vision. And she gave birth to a son, a male child who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. And her child was called up to God and to his throne. Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared by God so that there she would be nourished for 1,260 days. Now we ask the question, who's the child? We've already answered it because there was really no way to discuss what was happening up until this moment without already identifying the child. It's our Lord. It's our Savior, Jesus Christ. The woman is a church. The faithful remnant of Old Testament Israel has brought about and bore a son, our Messiah. But there's some key things here that point to who he is and about what he is here to do. It says there that he shall rule the nations with a rod of iron. It points back to Psalm chapter 2, one of my favorite Psalms, verse 9, you shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall shatter them like earthenware. This verse and this idea is also applied to Jesus in Revelation chapter 19. where we see from his mouth comes a sharp sword so that with it he may strike down the nations and he will rule them with a rod of iron and he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God, the Almighty. So we find this power and this authority that has been given to the child, to the Christ, to the Son of God. But notice here, it doesn't just describe his authority. It also describes his place of his authority because it says her child was caught up to God and to his throne. So it's very clear here what's describing to us is Christ in his power and in his, in his glory at his ascension, being taken up into heaven and seated in his position of authority at the right hand of God. Which is interesting because here in this passage, in just one verse, we move from the birth of Jesus Christ all the way to his ascension, seemingly skipping over the entirety of his life. And why would that be? Well, because John's purpose here is not to cover the entire life of Christ, but to point and to reveal the power that Jesus has when it comes to the persecution of the church and his defeat of the church's enemies. The people of God, they already knew, again, this is letter is written to Christians. They already understand this. So John is painting this broad picture here for them to understand that what they're seeing take place in front of them is not new. Satan has been doing this against God and against the promise of the, of the Messiah since the very beginning. So he paints this picture that they understand that, but now he moves all the way to this other side and saying, listen, now Jesus, this child, is seated in a place of authority and power because he is seated at the right hand of God the Father. He's in a place where no matter what happens in this life, no matter what happens on this earth, you do not have to fear. What an encouragement that is. You know, I'm often, <laughs> I'm often reminded of Jonathan Edwards and his resolutions that he came up with. And I can't remember what number uh, of resolution it was, but one of his resolutions is, you know, whenever I begin to feel too sorry for myself, I resolve to think upon the martyrs in the flames. Because when we understand the potential of what could be, we understand how oftentimes what we are facing isn't that bad. But what we're going to find in this passage is that there are times, 
Whereas believers, we are called not just to suffer in physical persecution or, or, or anguish in, in the time in which we live. There are times that we are called to lay down our very life. And John writes these things to them that he, that they need to understand that some of them are going to lose their life for the sake of the gospel. Some of them are going, their physical lives are going to be taken from them. But even in those moments, to be reminded and encouraged that Jesus is still on the throne. And what happens to them in this life does not matter in the least. Because the greatest thing that any of us possess this morning, I don't care how rich or poor we are, I don't care how many things we have, how famous we are, whatever those things may be. The greatest thing that we possess as a Christian is the knowledge of our forgiveness of sin and the promise of eternal life with God in heaven forever. And nothing in this world can take that away. No matter how great the power, no matter how great the kingdom, no matter how great the earthly authority, no matter how strong they may seem on the outside, they can't take that away from you. And this is the encouragement that John is bringing to the church because what's getting ready to unfold before them? They're getting ready to watch the greatest army in their time, the most powerful army, the most wicked army in their time, march against their city in a city where they feel relatively safe in a place where the defenses have been built and secured that many people inside the city would thought this will never happen. But as the walls begin to fall and everything that they have built up politically and economically and structurally begins to fall down around them, John does not want them to be driven to fear. He wants them to be driven to hope and to peace and to security in what Christ has accomplished on their behalf. Now notice in verse 6, it tells us that the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared by God so that there she would be nourished for 1,260 days. We're going to find more detail in later verses about this moment because what's going to happen in verses 7 through 12 is John is going to do what he's really doing with the second half of the book. Verses 1 through 6 paint this broad picture. And in verses 7 through 12, he's going to come back and highlight a few of these moments and open them up into greater context. And then he does the same thing in verses 13 through 17. He again opens up more broadly some of what he has described in these opening verses. It would suffice to say, when this woman flees into the wilderness, what we find is that the persecution from Satan through the Romans arises there in the city of Jerusalem. We find the church fleeing Israel for protection. This happens in fulfillment of what Jesus had commanded them. Remember there in the book of Matthew, he tells them that when you see the army surrounding the city, flee to the wilderness. And history tells us that that's exactly what the church in Jerusalem did. They fled to the wilderness to Pella and there remained for three and a half years while the destruction was falling upon the city. But there's a beautiful thing in this passage that stood out to me, right? Because this woman is not just fleeing into the wilderness on her own sake. She's not just fleeing under the wilderness in her own direction and guidance. But notice there it says that she fled to the wilderness where she had a place prepared by God. This would have been such a beautiful reminder of encouragement to the God's people that God is continually watching over for them and caring for them. That even in the midst of the wilderness, even in the midst of having to flee outside the city, God has not only prepared a place for them to go, but it says here that they would be nourished for 1,260 days. It's that same three and a half year period that we find the fall of the city and the temple. Brothers and sisters, may we find the same encouragement in our own, our own hearts and souls this morning. That God supersedes all things that happen on this earth. Nothing happens outside of his control. 
as I woke up this morning. I don't, I don't know why it was on my head, but as I was getting ready for coming to church this morning, this, this continual thought just kept popping into my head. Nothing happens by chance. Right? Because we live in a world where chance is given a lot of credit. Luck, chance, fate. And none of those things exist. There's no such thing as luck. There's no such thing as chance. Everything happens according to the plan and purpose and providence and sovereignty of God. And just as God attempted to encourage his people as the reminder of that what we see unfolding around us is not a new story, but a continual old story that has happened from the very beginning, we should understand that as well. Because Satan has not yet given up in his attempts to crush the church. Satan has not yet given up in his attempts to thwart the plans of God. Why do we see Christians fall? Why do we see people and things in our life that we cannot wrap our minds around because Satan has not given up in his attempts? But let us be encouraged that he cannot win. Later next week, we're going to look again and be reminded of that passage of Scripture where Jesus tells you and tells us. He tells his disciples, but tells us as well. He says, I say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. Far too long, the church has viewed that verse as a verse of defense that all the Christians are just huddled behind the gate and the, and the powers of hell are, are steaming on the outside trying to break it down and we just huddle inside, but ultimately hell will not overcome. But I view that verse from a different direction. I view that verse as the church on the offensive. And that as we go out and we proclaim the gospel and we preach the truth of God's word and we proclaim the name of Christ in a darkened and a troubled world, we are on the offensive and we are moving against the gates of hell and ultimately they will fall and crumble by the wayside because they cannot be, they will always be overcome by the power of the truth of the gospel and God's word. May we be encouraged in what God has promised to us here in this passage this morning. Let's pray together. Father, this morning, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth of what you have promised to us here. Lord, as we understand this old story of your promise of the Messiah and Satan's hatred for your truth, Satan's hatred for Jesus and Satan's hatred for the church. Lord, may we not be surprised when we see things happen in this world around us. Lord, may we pray for more boldness and for more power and may we trust in the, in the beauty of your word that you will accomplish what you have set forth to do. Lord, despite everything that Satan threw against the nation of Israel, Despite everything that Satan threw against Jesus, your plan was not thwarted. Jesus came and he was born and he died and he has resurrected to sit at your right hand. And throughout history, despite everything that Satan has done in order to stop the missionary movement of the gospel, to stop the growth of the New Testament church, you have continually provided for and protected and watched over your people. Lord, may we be reminded of that when we are tempted to doubt or be discouraged by what we see happening around us. Because Jesus is still on the throne. The gospel is still our business and our motivator, and it will not cease to be until that day when Jesus comes back to take us all home. So may we continue forth in what you have commanded us to do. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name.